In this video, we will be discussing the contributions of Aristotle, Galileo, and Newton. Let's begin with Aristotle and his three laws of motion. Law 1. Aristotle believed that forces are needed to keep things moving because they stop when the force is taken away. How can we refute this law? Well, all we have to do is we have to consider the force of friction. When you stop pushing an object, it stops moving because the force of friction that is present slows it down. Aristotle's second law, the speed of an object depends on the size of the force. Again, this might seem like it makes sense. If you had one horse pulling a cart, it would only move a certain speed. If you had two horses pulling the same cart, then it would move at twice the speed. If you had three and four and five and so on, it would move three, four, five times the speed. The more horses you add, then you would increase the speed by that much. By this thinking, if you had an infinite number of horses, then you could move at an infinite speed. But as we now know, there is a certain speed limit in the universe. It's what we call the speed of light. All evidence up to this point has shown that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So that is how his second law is refuted. Aristotle's third law. Heavier objects are more strongly attracted to the earth because they fall faster. Again, this one at face value might seem like it makes sense. If you had a heavy ball and you dropped it to the earth, and if you also had a feather and you dropped it to the earth, which one would reach first? You know from experience, the heavy ball does. But why is that? Well, it's because we haven't considered the force of air resistance. If there was no air resistance, then both of them would hit the ground at the same time. Let's take a look at that in this clip. Now, let's talk about Galileo Galilei and his contributions to science. In particular, he made contributions to the branches of motion and astronomy. Let's talk about motion first. So, Galileo Galilei, he disproved Newton's third law. What he did was, he took small balls and big balls of different masses, light ones and heavy ones, and he rolled them along a plank. And what he did was, he effectively took away air resistance. Both of them, heavier light, rolled down the plank at the same rate. By doing this experiment, he showed that it didn't matter the mass. Heavy or light, all objects are attracted to the Earth at the same rate. What contributions did he make in the field of astronomy? Well, he discovered four moons orbiting Jupiter. He studied the phases of Venus, and he also discovered that there were spots on the Sun, which are aptly called sunspots. Now, we we'll move on to Newton's three laws of motion. These three laws you have to know in order, and they are as follows. Law 1. An object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in motion in a straight line will remain in motion in a straight line unless acted upon by some external or unbalanced force. What does this law mean? It means if you have a rock sitting in one place, it will remain sitting in that place unless you come and kick it, right? You will provide the external or unbalanced force. If you have an object that is moving along in a straight line, then it will keep on moving along in a straight line unless there is some force to come and stop it. This, again, might not seem like it is the case when you look at normal everyday interactions. If you take a ball and you roll it along in a straight line, it will eventually come to a stop, even though you might not see something for it to hit into. But why is that the case? It's because of the force of friction. If we were to eliminate friction, then anytime you take an object and you give it a little push to start off, it will keep on moving with a constant velocity in a straight line. This is the case when you're traveling in space. We have taken rockets and accelerated them to a certain speed, and after we take off the rocket boosters, they keep on coasting at a constant speed. Let's take a look at this clip that shows Newton's first law in action. 
If you get into a car accident, the force of impact will stop the car, but your inertia dictates that your body will tend to continue moving. And this is why we wear seat belts, because without them, we might continue moving right through the windshield, which wouldn't be very fun. Newton's second law states that the net force acting on an object is equal to its mass times acceleration. Let's take a look at an example. In this example, we are to determine the acceleration. So we have a box of mass 5 kilograms that is being pushed along with a force of 10 newtons and it is going against a frictional force of 7 newtons. What will be the acceleration of the box? So here we have our diagram, right? We have this 5 kilogram object, the box on the ground. You are pushing to the right with 10 newtons and friction, which always opposes motion, is then acting to the left. So after we draw our diagram, we should identify our givens. We know that the mass is 5 kilograms, that's explicitly stated. What is the net force? Well, the net force will be 10 newtons minus 7 newtons, which is 3 newtons. Remember, we have already learned how to determine the resultant of anti-parallel forces. If positive is to the right, then negative is to the left. So what will be our acceleration? We have our formula from Newton's second law, F equals MA. If we rearrange that, we'll get that acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. If you wish, you can use our equation triangle. Substituting our values, we'll get that acceleration A is equal to 3 newtons divided by 5 kilograms, which gives us 0.6 newtons per kilogram. But more aptly, when we're talking about acceleration of an object, we should have it in terms of meters per second squared. So our answer is 0.6 meters per second squared. Also, please note that we can write this unit a different way. We have m and s to the negative 2 power. Newton's third law states that for every action force, there is an equal but opposite reaction force. You may not think of it this way, but right now you are sitting on a chair. You are exerting a force downwards on that chair, and at the same time, the chair is exerting a force upward on you. You may not be conscious of it, but that is really the case. You will become conscious of it if you sit down too fast on that chair and it hurts your butt. Then you say, ow! but that chair hurt me back. How is that possible? Well, it's because you exerted a force downwards on the chair and the chair exerted a force equal and opposite back up on you. You don't feel it when you sit lightly because it is a small force then, but when you sit too fast, the force is too great, so then it really hurts your butt. Now, let's take a look at this clip that shows more about Newton's third law. Think of a car hitting a brick wall. The car imparts an action force on the wall from its motion and the wall imparts a reaction force right back on the car, bringing it to a quick stop. These vectors are equal in length and point in opposite directions. What this also means is that there can never be a single isolated force, as any force is an interaction. Forces must always exist in pairs. Let's look at another example. When a rock falls to the ground, the gravitational force from the Earth causes the object to accelerate towards the earth, but it is also the case that the earth is accelerating towards the rock. This must be true according to the third law. Of course, we don't notice this in everyday experience, because the acceleration of each object is inversely proportional to its mass. The rock is very light, so the rock accelerates quickly. The earth is very heavy, so Earth's acceleration is completely negligible. 